What's up, college football fans? Don't forget to check out and order your copy of Stiff Arming Football Myths, our latest football game plan book. So go on our website at footballgameplan.com slash books and get your copy. We have these available in paperback as well as in PDF form. game in the Pac-12 between Arizona and Oregon and for the Wildcats in this game it's all about maximizing opportunities they put together a pretty explosive offense with a new Solomon at quarterback and where they can't afford a letdown this week is in the red zone the Wildcats not only have to own the time of possession but also have to finish it off with sevens defensively you want to make Oregon play downhill and protect the perimeter and win with your battery that's defensive tackle Mike Backer and safeties now Oregon had to eke out a win last week versus Wazoo but overall on the season they have played pretty well well, quarterback Marcus Mariota still has yet to toss an interception, but you can have a slight question mark about what went on last week from a protection standpoint. That type of leakage up front can't happen again versus Arizona. Now, the biggest matchup Oregon has to win is in the secondary, and I think they match up well versus the quartet of talent at wide receiver for the Wildcats. Not like the Ducks in a very close game versus the Wildcats. Look for the Ducks special teams unit to play a huge role in this win. Another big conference battle between Texas A&M and Mississippi State, and while the Aggies almost let one slip away last week versus Arkansas, you have to give their defense credit for coming up with the much-needed stop in the running game. Now, this week versus Mississippi State, the Aggies will have to play assignment football versus Dak Prescott and running back Josh Robinson. Another area where the Aggies can't slip up is in coverage. It's easy to get caught looking in the backfield versus Mississippi State, and that's when the Bulldogs pop a big play downfield. Now, you can't say enough good things about Dan Mullen and the job he's done with the Bulldogs this year. Offensively, they don't beat themselves and they stay ahead of the chains. The biggest X factor in this game for them is to not get outside of the framework of what they do well, which is controlling the line of scrimmage and running the football. Defensively, I like what they do within their front seven with Benardrick McKinney, and if they're going to have any success, he'll have to have his best game of the season. Now, it's going to be tough for Mississippi State, and I do like the Aggies to win this one. Teams that are able to spread the field give Mississippi State problems, and the Aggies can not only do that, but they can also do it at a fast pace. Ohio State travels to Maryland to take on the Terrapins, and you have to be impressed with the play of Richard freshman quarterback JT Barrett, who has gotten better each and every week. Now, versus Maryland, he'll be facing a very aggressive 3-4 defense with two outstanding outside linebackers in Matt Robinson and Yannick Cujo Virgil. The offensive line of the Buckeyes is going to be key. Can they move Maryland off the spot on the inside will be what you should be looking for. Defensively, Joey Bosa is well on his way to All-American honors again this year, and linebacker Curtis Grant Company will be tested once again by an offense that thrives on misdirection. And it'll be interesting to see who and how they game plan and cover Stephon Diggs, who's one of the most electrifying players in the country. Now, the Terrapins are 1-0 in Big Ten play, and they are extremely consistent on offense. Now, this week is about them not leaving points on the field. The Terps always start off fast offensively and defensively. They are excellent on third downs. Can they consistently make plays in the air? I don't think they can. I like the Buckeyes in this one. They're going to force C.J. Brown to beat them passing, and in my opinion, that'll be tough to do against this Buckeyes pass rush. Two very good defensive football teams kick off Saturday as Stanford travels to South Bend to take on Notre Dame. And the biggest thing Stanford must do is to find ways to get chunk plays. And they have two guys on offense that can do just that. That's running back Barry Sanders Jr. and wide receiver Ty Montgomery. Whether it's traditional or creative, their opportunities this game must increase. Now defensively, Stanford can play aggressive or sit back in the zone and be equally as effective. The biggest responsibility this week is keeping Notre Dame's quarterback Everett Golson contained in the pocket in the back seven has to be able to make one-on-one -on -one plays in space. For Notre Dame, it starts and ends with ball security. Syracuse was able to hang around because the Irish got sloppy with the football. Now versus Stanford, Notre Dame has to be able to take advantage of their athletes in space. That's where the Irish can be successful by spreading out the Cardinal. And defensively, their defensive line has to maintain or reestablish the line of scrimmage. Stanford's game plan doesn't change week to week. And if you can't win up front, it's over for you as a football team. Now, I like the Irish in this game. I think defensively, they match up well versus Stanford and will do a great job in taking away Montgomery, which is essentially taking away the big play potential of that Cardinal offense. 
Here's a key battle in the Big 12 between Baylor and Texas, and the biggest misconception going on right now is that Baylor is a pass-happy offense, when in all actuality, they're one of the most well-balanced teams in the country. This game will be decided up front as you look at the Bears' offensive line that has not given up a sack all season long, and a defensive line with defensive lineman Sean Oakman playing great this year with 18 sacks as a whole. The simple key for Bryce Petty in that Baylor offense is to not allow themselves to become one-dimensional, and defensively they have to keep constant pressure down that A and B gap versus Swopes. Now, Texas is fresh off a defensive shutout versus Kansas, and we know head coach Charlie Strong's forte is on that side of the football, and he has had experience while at Louisville playing this style of offense, so it'll be interesting to see what he's dialing up from a pressure perspective up front. Now, on offense, the Longhorns have got to get better production out of their ground game. Look for the Longhorns to go with more trap and misdirection run plays to try to calm that pass rush or that rush from the Bears. And I think you'll see Tyrone Swoops make huge strides in this game. I just don't think it'll be enough to knock off Baylor. Look for Baylor's secondary to step up huge in this game, taking away both Harris and Shipley. LSU travels to Auburn to take on the Tigers, and for LSU, two decisions have to be made in order for this team to move forward. Number one, freshman quarterback Brandon Harris has to be able to start at quarterback, and number two, Kendall Beckwith must start at middle linebacker. Those two positions have been sore spots for LSU so far this season, and against a team like Auburn, they can't afford a slow start. You have to like the progression of the freshman phenoms in Leonard Fournette, Malachi Dupree and Trey Quinn. Now defensively, the X factor will be safety play. You can't get caught looking in the backfield. It's about keeping your eyes on your luggage versus Auburn. Now for the Auburn Tigers, their defense has been vastly underrated all season long. They're getting teams off the field on third downs and forcing them to be one-dimensional. Devontae Lambert and Gabe Bright are putting in some serious work up front. Now offensively, we know the ground game is where it needs to be, but Nick Marshall and that passing offense has to be able to get on the same pace. They're leaving too many opportunities on the field, and Auburn will have to work the backs more in the passing game on option routes versus those LSU linebackers. I like Auburn in this game. The Tigers, while it may not always look pretty, they don't beat themselves and are excellent on special teams, and they'll need all three aspects this week versus LSU to get it done. Good matchup in the Sun Belt Conference as UL Monroe takes on Arkansas State. And when the Warhawks quarterback Pete Thomas is on his game, the Warhawks offense looks dynamic. The consistency has to be there from series to series. Now, ULM loves to spread the field, and that puts any defense in a bind, which is why Arkansas State's defense has to have an encore performance like they did versus a very talented Utah State team. The Red Wolves' strength lies within their linebacking core, and the goal has to be making running back Centaurus Donald a non-factor. Now, I like ULM in this ballgame. The Warhawks, despite their inconsistency, have a good foundation in place with the offensive line and the defensive front seven. So look for them to go on the road and knock off the Red Wolves. Raheem Cato and his Marshall Thundering Herd are fresh off a bye week to take on Old Dominion, and no one is surprised at how well the Herd have been playing offensively. Cato is one of the most polished quarterbacks in the country and has that offense rolling like a well-oiled machine. It's been the play of the defense that has raised eyebrows, only allowing an impressive 16 points a game. The same can't be said about the Monarchs defense that makes every game entertaining to say the least. Their quarterback Taylor Heineke is just as impressive as Cato, but if they're going to win this ball game, it'll have to be with their defense's ability to get off the field, which has been a problem all season long, which is also why I'm going with Marshall in this ball game. Keep an eye on defensive end Rashid Myers. This is a guy at 6'5", 252 pounds with a lot of potential and a lot of upside. He could be huge in this ball game playing contained versus Heineke. The Miami Hurricanes take on the undefeated Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets and freshman quarterback Brad Kaya seems to have found his rhythm and the game appears to be slowing down for him at this juncture in the season. The biggest coaching point in this one for the Canes is getting the ball in the hands of their two top game breakers in running back Duke Johnson and wide receiver Philip Dorsett. We'll also learn a lot about the Canes' run defense as they face the Yellow Jackets' triple option attack, which can now be considered the quadruple option attack with the play of quarterback Justin Thomas and how he's done in the passing game. And where the Yellow Jackets have been surprisingly effective is in the secondary, only allowing 207 yards a game and six interceptions. If they're going to have a chance in this matchup, it'll be because they built an early lead versus the Canes, and I think they will, and I like the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets in this one. This defense will go aggressive early and force three and outs and let their offense take the air out of the ball to preserve the victory. Next, we go to the AAC where the Memphis Tigers take on the Cincinnati Bearcats and third downs will be the name of the game in this one for the Tigers. Every time momentum is being built on offense, self-inflicted wounds take them off the field. Quarterback Paxton Lynch 
has to do a better job in protecting the football. Now, in the trenches is where the Tigers have been excellent all year long on both sides of the ball. And the Bearcats offense forces you to defend every blade of grass. Gunner Kill, the quarterback, and Mikael McKay, the receiver, have developed a very nice chemistry so far this season. Defensively, they're stout in the front seven, but they struggle in the secondary and routinely give up the big play. Now, Memphis will be tough early, but look for that Bearcat offense to kick in the gear around the second quarter and start to pull away from the Tigers. I like Cincinnati. There shouldn't be a shortage of points when Buffalo and Bowling Green take the field. The Bulls' offense is once again explosive. Wide receivers Ron Willoughby and Devin Hughes are game breakers, while running back Anthon Taylor does his damage on the ground, averaging 4.7 yards a carry. Now, first-year head coach Dino Babers is known for his offense, and the Falcons haven't disappointed, averaging 500 yards a game of total offense. Now, the problem here is that both defenses can't get out of their own way. Bowling Green has dealt with injuries, and linebacker Gabe Martin has tried to hold that unit together, while for Buffalo, they can't defend the pass, and they struggle keeping teams out of the end zone inside the 20. Now, what looks like it should be a shootout will probably end up being a low-scoring game, and i like the Falcons to win in a close one versus Buffalo. And finally, in the Mountain West Conference, Boise State takes on the surprising 3-1 Nevada Wolfpack, and right off the bat for the Broncos, they must get better play from senior quarterback Grant Hedrick. Right now, it has been un like with the turnovers that have doomed the Broncos so far this season, especially last week versus Air Force. Now, defensively, the Broncos are still stout and can get pressure, and they face a Wolfpack team led by Cody Fajaro that owns a TOP and gets excellent play on the back end in their secondary. Now, what we haven't seen so far from Nevada is their run defense get tested. They face teams that love to air it out, and this would be their first huge test Outside of the misdirection game that the Arizona Wildcats like to play, now when they've been asked to make a stop, they have, and I think they will, with Brock Hacking and company, they'll rise to the challenge again and be able to slow down the Boise State offense. I like Nevada to win this one at home. And also don't forget to check out every Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, College Football Now on our Football Game Plan Radio Network located at blogtalkradio.com slash football game plan.